Ivanova. Thank you very much, Chair, and the panel for the opportunity for us to present on, I guess, what is now called the rebuttal exercise. I will make some opening comments and then I'll hand over to members of the Telcom panel. We are really at the at what we call the inflection point of South Africa's market reform program. Up until now we've seen a lot of experimentation when it gets to regulatory intervention. Over the last two days, uh, some have said that we've had some successes. Others have said that we've also had many failures when it got to our experimentation with regulatory intervention. But what Telcom is really appealing for here is that the authority would not speculate or experiment with the unbundling of the local loop. And we spoke at length to say that there is clearly so much at stake for speculation and experimentation around local loop unbundling. I guess there are two things now in this in, in this summation that, that we, we, we have been disappointed at. I think the first one was the the quality of engagement. We we really viewed this as an opportunity for industry captains and other stakeholders to to engage meaningfully on issues that are clearly complex and and problematic and challenging. But instead some Operators, quite frankly, chose to behave opportunistically. Some took upon them the form of telecom, and they and they 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 attempted to speak with authority and sincerity on behalf of telecom. That the essence of their message was: local loop unbundling is good for telecom. You've heard that virtually with every presentation, with the exception of Telcom, that local loop unbundling will be good for Telcom. Yet these same operators have acknowledged that they don't know the network architecture of Telcom. They don't know the cost structures of Telcom. They don't know the social obligations that Telcom bear. But seemingly, they arrive at this informed position that this intervention will be good for Telcom. Now, they may have been sincere, but we want to inform the authority that they've been sincerely wrong. Okay? We, we've also been disappointed at the lack of evidence, data, information on local loop unbundling in the international context the lack thereof provided by the authority. It should really have been a basis for a meaningful discussion for operators and others to interrogate, validate and challenge those data sets. Again, we've been having these two, three days in the absence of that evidence and so many have been making a lot of speculations. We've heard and we've had it on record that local loop unbundling will increase jobs, it will increase the copper access network, it will increase revenues. We've, we've heard it being said, but in the absence of any evidence, any data to support or validate. And then we had Africa analysis and quite frankly within 10 minutes they successfully challenged or at least questioned some of these assumptions. Now it was a cursory study, a presentation on the UK that says no but jobs was lost. Copper access loops did not increase. 
revenues simply shifted, wealth was created from one operator to the other, or from one part of the business to the other part. And the issue there was, we did not have any other data provided by the authority to, in, to challenge, validate, even the information provided by Africa Analysis. And quite frankly, according to my knowledge, that seems to be the only evidence that was submitted here over the two-day period. My colleagues are, will be responding to one or two of the other issues. One or two of the questions was left over for today. Um, and to the extent that they can, I'd just like to hand over to them. Thanks, um, Dr. Barron. So, good afternoon, Chair and Councillor Curry and your committee members. So, just to make a few um, prefacing remarks, um, largely repetitive of yesterday, I wish to remind the authority that Telcom is still under closed period. Um, nothing has changed in the last 24 hours, so the line of questioning um, that is going to be directed towards Telcom. We will again elect to exercise the same degree of caution and circumspect as we did yesterday in relation to the responses that may potentially have a material effect on the movement of the share price throughout the course of this closed period. So, Chair, if you will indulge us um, in, in our election of having to exercise those rights. We also note, Chair, the unusual nature of these proceedings having been conducted uh, via live streaming. We welcome, in principle, the innovation, um, but we'd just like to uh, emphasise the fact that this wasn't really set out in much detail prior to the commencement of these hearings, and uh, we wish for the authority to make it clear um, in future what the applicable procedure is going to be in public hearings. But as, as I said, we welcome, in principle, the innovation. We think it's good, and we think it... It, uh, it broadens the potential audience and their participation in these proceedings. If I may move on to, um, to give treatment to some of the substantive issues, I wish to make it clear at the outset that it's, it's become very obvious um, that there is not really that much in substance for Telcom to rebut. Um, the various uh, presentations that have preceded us have served to really re-emphasise the issues that have been already made, already been made in the written submissions of various parties as well as the oral submissions. And so the, the large extent of, of our substantive submissions um, that were made um, quite at length yesterday have not been rebutted in any degree or manner, um, apart from some comments which have been made in jest um, and comments which really don't go to the substance of the issues at hand. And so our, our, our view, of course, is that the, the two issues um, that we elect to hold over to address today, uh, the one whether or not uh, roaming amounts to a degree of uh, spectrum sharing and whether or not the radio frequency spectrum may be considered as a facility and therefore subject to the mandatory obligation under Chapter 8. Uh, those are the two issues that, uh, if I recall, um, we had elected to hold over and address specifically today and that the remainder of the issues we had um, agreed with the authority um, to give treatment to those issues in writing at a subsequent stage. Um, Chair, I will request um, that you confirm that these are the two issues indeed that we need to give treatment to today as part of our rebuttals before giving treatment to them. I remind you that you have the response, the, the opportunity to respond to any other issue that's been raised as well. That's correct. I just wanted to recap the fact that the, we had made an undertaking to give treatment to the issues that were directly raised as part of the proceedings yesterday. Um, and, and with your indulgence yesterday, you did indicate that we would be able to address those issues directly today. So just to confirm, are those the only two issues or are there other issues that we had um, inadvertently missed to, to address today? I don't recall you saying more than two that you addressed today. Thank you, Chair. Over and above the two issues, um, I also want to uh, perhaps make a few remarks in relation to Esper's comments that were made uh, a few a few minutes ago. But before before dealing with that, um, on the matter of um, of whether or not roaming amounts to 
a degree of, of spectrum sharing. Um, we, we viewed, and of course the, the issue was raised in context of the relationship that Telcom has with MTN um, in the provisioning of, um, of, of mobile telecommunication services through ATA. Um, of course, Chair, you'll, you'll already acknowledge that a roaming arrangement is a commercial agreement. Um, a commercial arrangement that's subject to negotiation between the two parties as to how that arrangement is to be crystallised in the form of agreements. And so there are various um, considerations that go uh, with that. Um, suffice to say that it is not part of a spectrum sharing agreement, of course. Um, we're not entirely clear as to what the regulatory framework is for spectrum sharing in the country, but we take the view that in our particular circumstance, um, the agreement that we have with MTN has no aspect of spectrum sharing whatsoever. Indeed, the, the authority would be well aware that uh, Telcom does possess access to the radio frequency spectrum um, of its own right, and so does MTN. And so, um, in relation to spectrum sharing, uh, from an active perspective, we really don't consider that to be the, the case at all. We do think um, also that the, the, the roaming agreement is a commercial agreement, is not subject to any uh, mandatory obligation for us to file the agreements either um, and, and to that extent we, we consider it as, as not being subject to regulation. So that takes care of that issue um, of whether or not um, roaming can be equated to spectrum sharing. With regards to whether or not we consider the radio frequency spectrum as such uh, to fall within the definition of what a facility is, uh, you recall that we were very, um, uh, very clear uh, in our articulation of what the appropriate uh, interpretation of Section 1 ought to be. We view the list, uh, the indicative list, as being exhaustive. Uh, we don't believe that the authority possesses the discretion to add to that list um, and by some magic include the radio frequency spectrum in there. Um, so we don't seek to either explicitly or implicitly support the views that have been expressed by either MTN and Vodacom um, on whether or not the radio frequency spectrum amounts to a facility. Um, our, our, our view is, is on a proper construction of Section 1. Uh, we fail to see how air as, as, the, as the medium um, by which uh, transmission is, is proper or propagated through the radio frequency spectrum falls to be considered as a facility within that definition. So that takes care of that issue. Um, I want to make a few remarks in relation to Esper's uh, comments. Um, this morning, or um, rather earlier on today, with regards to our interpretation of Section 1, we, we again stand by the interpretation we've advanced to the authority. Um, and the, there is a lot more magic in ISPA's um, attempts to fashion some sort of a definition of locally bundling. There really is no magic, as far as we're concerned, in the absence of of that definition. Um, it's glaringly obvious that one cannot simply conjure uh, a definition which doesn't exist and the, the, the very fact that you're trying to group together some sort of facilities as defined in that list in order to, for you to arrive at a creative solution um, of fitting in a locally bundling uh, provision in there demonstrates the fact that you would need to exercise some degree of magic to get to that, uh, that outcome. So that's our view in relation to that comment that was made by ISPA. Um, and then again, it's consistent with the view that we've professed in relation to the lack of a definition of sexual one for locally and bundling. Um, and lastly, Chair, I think um, in, in relation to RIA, again, ISPA made the point that nowhere would you find um, a, a requirement uh, in the Electronic Communications Act um, that the authority ought to undertake uh, regulatory impact assessments prior to intervening um, and making regulatory uh, um, um, interventions, and and that is that is correct. Uh, we, we wish not uh, to align specifically um, to that view, but of course the authority will be very well aware um, that there have been commitments made by the authority to Parliament, and indeed it's very clearly articulated um, at various stages in your annual report that you've committed to undertake a framework of developing RIAs, and you view that as important. Um, in undertaking your regulatory activities. So it's not a statement that we've made um, without context. Um, and in fact, Telcom is not the only licensee that has made the statement about the importance of RIAs. Uh, we may perhaps be one of the, the last um, regulatory authorities in the world not to consider the importance of RIAs as part of a regulatory process aimed at ensuring 
that intervention is proportionate and is reasonable and it actually deals with issues that ought to be dealt with in a responsible manner. So um, having recourse to the absence of a compulsion um, to conduct RIAs doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a good idea. I think all of us agree that they're a good idea um, and, and more so the authority having undertaken to actually develop a framework to conduct these RIAs. So, um, it's not merely a view professed by Telcom in isolation. It is a view that we are emphasising um, and, and we are calling upon the authority to proceed with developing that framework because it is more so important uh, in relation to this particular inquiry. So I think those are the issues that I wish to give treatment to. Um, I will hand over to my fellow colleagues if they are of the view that there are issues that they wish to give treatment to. Thank you. So, so Chair, I think that, that very much takes care of our um, rebuttal sessions. We wish not to give any substantive treatment to every single issue that's been raised. Um, of course, we are um, the only licensee here that's in the proverbial uh, spotlight. So um, with that, we are ready to take on questions that the, that the panel wishes to direct to indeed the public. Thank you, Telcom. Dr. Barnsley, you presume to chastise the authority for not providing evidence. This is a hearing. It is not our role to provide evidence. You cited the AFRIC analysis as the only real evidence. The authority has taken note of the misleading nature of that evidence. I have a question from Paul Hewell via my broadband. I have two questions, and the first prefaces the second. Firstly, Telcom does not have the best reputation for having the correct interpretation of law. Brackets, see particularly Telcordia Technologies Inc. versus Telcom SA Limited, 2006, ZASCA 112, where the appellate court rather aptly found guilty of the following. Symptomatic of this case is the verbal manipulation indulged in by the High Court and by Telcom by reclassifying and relabeling. Close brackets, close quote. <coughs> it is understood that Telcom objects to the authorities facilities leasing regulations and plans to take the matter to court. Is it not, however, currently the case that until a court of law pronounces otherwise, the authorities' understanding of the law must prima facie be accepted? So we, we have made um, various submissions in our written representations in relation to the appropriate interpretation of law. It cannot simply be that we ought to take as given the authority's interpretation of provisions in law. Um, I think the, the author of the question ought to be mindful um, that all natural persons have the ability to exercise their own faculties in arriving at what their interpretation of the law is. Um, I, I fail to understand the origins of this prima facie expectation that um, natural persons ought to take as given um, an administrative body's interpretation of law. I, I pause to reflect in the last 10 years um, the amount of times that Telcom has been cited in either the High Court or the Appellate Court vis-à-vis -vis the number of times that the authority has been cited in the exact same tribunals and um, on a cursory reflection and, and having spent three years working for the authority I think the number far outweighs um, and it's not a matter of whether or not we are correct in law um, we can have these debates um, as part of this inquiry and I think uh, the very nature of this inquiry um, provides the environment for us to have these debates whether or not we correct in law uh, is not for the authority to decide, nor is it for us to decide whether the authority is correct in law. It is ultimately for the courts to decide. So um, we've professed particular views, and the authority has taken a particular position. 
Um, and in the event that there is no agreement in those positions, of course, each party reserves the rights to seek further clarification in the appropriate forums. And that's simply what we've stated in our own submission, and we stand by that position. Thank you for your response. And to continue, secondly, assuming TOLCOM has a case at law before a, a court... before a court has found its legal proposition to be correct to act in defiance of facilities leasing regulations. Tolkien's interpretation appears to regard the local loop as a service or product in contrast to the authority's clear view that it constitutes facilities. If, as the ECA clearly demands, Tolkien and all license holders not exempted is required to make physical facilities such as copper lines, which are essential facilities to other operators, what stops the regulator from compelling Tolkien to make physical access to physical copper available to the operators? Whilst this will not practically bring about the benefits of LLU, it will enable other operators to make certain products to certain customers <coughs> and it will make cherry-picking the inevitable practice. So I think there's perhaps a third point there. Chair, I, uh, I wish to direct the author of the question to our submission. We've given extensive treatment to what we view as the appropriate interpretation of the relevant provisions that the authority seeks to rely upon and embark upon this process. We did spend quite some time um, uh, yesterday afternoon and, and to the early evenings, so the author was of the question was not a, was not present here. We we did get into um, a rather extensive dialogue between myself and your panel member on on what our respective views are. So uh, I would respectfully direct the author of that question to our submission for them to get a better appreciation of the legal arguments that we're making there. Chair Fru Yu, if I can just add to that as well, I, f I would just like to point out to the author of that question that if one has regard to the authority's discussion document, it is clear that, that the authority itself asked the question. And if I can perhaps pose that question again, um, it says, is ECASA's proposed approach to unbundling the local loop through implementation of facilities leasing regulations reasonable, feasible, and acceptable. So our reading of that question was that the authority itself invited comments on the interpretation of those facilities leasing regulations and the implementation thereof. Thank you. Do we have any further questions for Tokom? Thank you, Tom. So, sorry, to just, sorry, just to re-emphasize the point, our, our, our position is not to directly challenge the regulations, the facilities leasing regulations. We're not, um, contrary to the question uh, posed, we have at no stage indicated that we intend embarking on a litigious route here. We've merely highlighted our concerns in relation to the process at hand, and at some stage we wish to have further engagement with the authority as to whether or not you agree with the positions that we've advanced. But the point is we're not challenging the validity or enforceability of these facilities, these regulations. We, com we continue to comply with them. Um, all, all that we're saying is that it's perhaps the incorrect framework to give treatment to something as complex and as uncontemplated as a local and bundling process. And that's simply what our assertions has been throughout the course of these proceedings. Okay, thank you.